T-N? Of course. It stands for Transforming Meditation. Well, why not? It is written. This is George Vanderman. Today It Is Written presents Transforming Meditation. 4,000 persons sat quietly, their eyes closed in Santa Monica City Auditorium. And then breaking the silence, a voice intoned. Imagine what it would be like if you went into yourself your very soul, your very being. And then the voice rose, taking on a hypnotic quality. Imagine being allowed the luxury of sitting here and fantasizing what could be and would be the best thing that could happen to you this week. Yes, more than six million Americans have taken up with meditation in some form. The San Francisco Chronicle recently published what it calls a primer of leading meditative groups, and it describes 17 of them in some detail. New varieties of the practice of meditation are appearing all of the time. It was the late Alan Watts who said, to go out of your mind at least once a day is tremendously important. And apparently a lot of people have believed him. The very popularity of meditation is really an indictment of our society. Evidently, six million people are not satisfied with what our society has given them. And evidently, even the churches have largely failed to fill these deep inner needs of the human heart. We've gone from one extreme to the other in our search for happiness and peace of mind, or whatever we're looking for. For a long time, we seemed to th afraid to think. Thinking was painful. Thinking produced guilt. Thinking emphasized our emptiness. And so we purposely allowed ourselves to be caught up in a round of business, pleasure, or both that would leave us no time to think. But now it's become popular to think by the hour. Meditation, in its simplest definition, is thinking. It's reflecting. It's thinking things over. Our thinking may or may not have a focus. It may or may not have direction. We may take our thinking out of drive and put it into neutral, but it's still thinking. And thinking, all thinking transforms us. And so all meditation, whatever the labor, whatever the label is transforming meditation. How it transforms whether for better or worse, depends on the nature of the meditation. There can be no question about the inescapable power of our thoughts to transform us, to influence us, to determine what we are and what we will be. It was Solomon, the wise man, who said in Proverbs 23, verse 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And by the way, it was Jesus himself who said in Matthew 12, 34. Matthew 12, here it is, Matthew 12, 34. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes, and Jesus pointed out that it is not necessary for man to commit an evil act in order to be guilty of sin. He can sin in his thoughts. He said in the fifth chapter over here, the fifth chapter of Matthew and the 22nd verse, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Anger in the heart, hatred in the heart, murder in the heart, sin, evidently. And the Apostle Paul gives us this counsel in Philippians 4 verse 8. That little book over here, Philippians 4, verse 8. He said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, Think on these things. 
Think on these things, evidently such thinking will have a beneficial effect. The implication, however, is that thinking on things opposite to these, things that are not pure and honest and true, will be harmful to the character. On one occasion, the enemies of Jesus came to him and complained that his disciples were neglecting the established and established custom. They were not always washing their hands before they ate. But Jesus seemed to be more concerned about something else than he was about the possibility of swallowing a few germs. He said over here in Matthew 7, Matthew 15, verses 16 to 19. Matthew 15, verses 16 to 19. Listen. Are you still so dull? <laughs> what Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, uh, theft, false testimony, slander. Evidently, if we could change the thoughts of men, we could solve the crime problem. If there were no wrong thinking, there'd be no, no crime. But you can't legislate morality, you see. The change would have to be voluntary. But now I want you to notice something. The Apostle James outlines the simple procedure by which a man goes wrong. Right over here in the little book that bears his name, the first chapter, verses 14 to 16. Here it is, James 1, verses 14 to 16. No, a man's temptation is due to the pull of his own inward desires, which greatly attract him. It is his own desire which conceives and gives birth to sin, and sin, when fully grown, produces death. Make no mistake about that, brothers of mine. The Bible is quite clear, isn't it? Desire, sin, death. That's the sequence. Or the thought, the act, the final result of the act. Someone has said it this way. Sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Evidently, thinking is serious business. Evidently, a man's destiny begins in his mind. But now I ask you, what if the thoughts are nonsense? Will the life be nonsense? What if the thoughts are meaningless? Will the life be meaningless? What if the thoughts are neutral? Will the life be neutral, never able to take a position on anything? That is the risk you take. Did you ever notice the reason that God gives for having to destroy the entire human race except for eight people in the days of Noah? Listen to this, quite clear and very, very helpful on our subject today, right here in Genesis, the sixth, Genesis, the sixth chapter and verse five. Genesis six, verse five. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The wickedness of man was great, and why? Because his imagination was evil. His thoughts were evil. His meditation was evil. I wonder what God would say about our thoughts and our imaginations and our meditation today. Could we be headed for a similar fate? Remember the words spoken to the 4,000 meditators. Imagine what it would be like if you went into yourself, your very soul, your very being. Is it possible that what we are seeking is within us? That all we need to do is to discover ourselves? Is it possible that all we need to do is to turn our eyes inward? Now, if you say yes, then I have another question to ask you. Is it possible that Jesus didn't know that we could save ourselves? Is it possible that Jesus died for us unnecessarily, unaware that we could manage nicely without any divine intervention? Is it possible that he who created us placed a spark of divinity within and then forgot about having done so? Jesus said in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Was he wrong? 
Now, I know that all this talk of self-realization, self-discovery, self-development, self-everything is very popular, but it frightens me. It sounds too much like self-deification, self-worship. It sounds too much like what the serpent, the fallen angel in disguise, said to Eve back there in the garden. Adam and Eve, you recall, had been carefully and lovingly warned that disobedience, that is, the eating of the forbidden fruit, would result in death. But the serpent told her in the third chapter here of Genesis, Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5, the serpent said, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. Ye shall not surely die, and ye shall be as gods. These are the two horns of the philosophy with which the enemy of our souls is impaling the world. This scripture has been frequently quoted on this telecast, and I'm not unaware of the repetition, but we can't be reminded too often of what Satan's basic philosophy is so that we can watch out for him. You'll find it everywhere, openly and in disguise. There's hardly a spiritual market anywhere that doesn't have it for sale. Going into yourself, into your very soul, into your very being. Discover yourself. Get in touch with yourself. Doesn't it sound suspiciously like, ye shall be as gods? Do we need to be pulled deeper into ourselves, or do we need to be pulled out of ourselves and drawn to the one who's able to save, who's able to do for us what we can't do for ourselves? Are we ourselves to be the focus of truth, or is God? The human inclination is to look to ourselves, when what we desperately need is to look to Jesus and not be at all in a hurry to conclude that look. Well, should the purpose of meditation be to think or to exclude thought? Is abandonment of thought, bankruptcy of thought, is that what we're after? Is it safe to let the mind wander inward, captured by a nonsense sound until the mind God gave us is in a trance state? totally open to any intruder? Is it safe? What happens when you leave a house unlocked? Somebody moves in, or takes over, or steals your valued possessions, or leaves it in horrible disarray. Is it any less dangerous to leave the mind open, unlocked, unguarded, with nobody at home? A house may be replaced. But even Lloyds of London can't give you another mind or pay you for the one you lose. Putting the mind in a neutral, inactivating it, is also putting the will and the conscience into neutral, inactivating them. That means that the will and the conscience are not in control. You have no check on what happens then. You're driving without brakes and anything can happen. So if we're going to meditate, there are questions we need to ask and then answer. Is our meditation constructive reflection? Or is it an escape mechanism, a cop-out? Does it draw, to draw us to Jesus? Does it lead us to repentance? Does it take away our guilt? Does it change our lifestyle and challenge our habits? Is it centered on Jesus or on self? Can we be satisfied with meaningless thought that doesn't go anywhere? Is the name of Jesus central in our meditation? The Apostle Paul said of that name, by the way, over here in Acts, the fourth chapter, Acts 4, verse 12, so important. Did you know that the Bible had so much to say about the mind? Look, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. None other name, see, whereby we must be saved. And the Apostle Paul said of Jesus over here in Philippians, the second chapter and the ninth verse. Philippians 2, verse 9. Listen. Therefore God exalted him, that's Christ, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, every name. 
Do any of us in our meditation want to be guilty, even unwittingly, of worshiping other gods? Gods that are not gods at all? Gods that cannot save? Do we want to divide our loyalty? Evidently, Jesus never intended that even his name should be used as a mantra, for he said in Matthew 7, verse 5, Matthew 7, verse 5, he said this, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition. Is our meditation, I should say, if our meditation is to have meaning, if it is to have direction, if it is to be constructive and transforming, what should be its content? What should we meditate about? Suppose we ask David. He had more to say about meditation than any other Bible writer, and he was concerned that his meditation should be pleasing to God. He said over here that uh, he, he prayed over here in the, the 19th Psalm, uh, the 14th verse. He prayed this prayer. Psalm 19, 14. Here it is. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. And David tells us the content of his meditation. He says in Psalm 119, verse 97, O oh, how love I thy law! It is my meditation all the day. And evidently he means it. If you'll read the 119th Psalm, you'll see that over and over he speaks about his love for God's law and God's commandments. Does this mean that a red-blooded man like David could actually love God's law and delight in it? Evidently, that's what he said. Evidently, David found meditating on God's law very rewarding. For he said in verse 165, Psalm 119, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Wonderful, isn't it? Peace, peace of mind. Isn't that what we've been looking for? Well, David told us where to find it. We should keep in mind, however, that when David speaks of the law, he's probably not referring to the Ten Commandments alone. That's included, to be sure. But not alone. It was common in his day to refer to the first five books of the Bible as the law. Our Jewish friends still do today. David could be meditating about the wonders of God, God's creation, you see, about the flood of Noah's day about the relationship of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob with their Lord and be meditating on God's law. And of course, there is much more than that in those five books. David may have been referring to all of the Bible that was available in his day. And David had a real purpose in storing up Scripture in his heart, in meditating. He said in Psalm 119, 11, he said, Thy word have I hid. See, thy word have I hid, stored away in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Wonderful verse. That's the secret, hiding this book in our minds. Listen, does our modern meditation keep us from sinning? Or does it tend to blur the definition of sin and silence the guilt that ought to lead us to the foot of the cross for forgiveness? Someone is saying, but Pastor Vandeman, this modern meditation does work. They say it helps you relax, and it cuts down stress, and it really does have quite a few benefits. Well, that I do not question. But could the very fact that a thing works be what makes it so dangerous? And tell me, if something works, does that make it good? Abortion works, doesn't it? But there's considerable controversy about its rightness or wrongness. Thalidomide worked, didn't it? Evidently, it was successful in relieving the nausea for which it was given. But that didn't keep it from being dangerous. That didn't keep it from de resulting in deformed babies. A drug may work. It may accomplish certain objectives, but its dangerous side effects may make it very unwise to use it. 
Then again, still using a drug as an illustration, a drug may cure a symptom, and by curing the symptom, it may mask the disease and cost a patient's life. You've seen it over and over again. What if our modern meditation should cure our tension and our inability to relax and a hundred other symptoms but mask our deep spiritual disease and keep us away from Jesus, the great physician, and cost us our eternal life? The real danger in modern meditation is that it should become a substitute for genuine spiritual life a substitute for looking at the Savior, a substitute for a personal, growing, dynamic relationship with our Lord. The real danger is that it should turn our worship inward and mask our need of a Savior. What then? What then? Jesus said in Mark 8, verses 36 and 37. Mark 8. 36 and 37. For what shall it profit a man, and you could repeat this with me, couldn't you? For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Oh, friend, if you're tired, if you can't relax, if you can't seem to find peace of mind, Jesus says, and says it to you personally, the prescription for all human ills. Matthew, the 11th chapter, verses 28 to 30. Listen to this. This is the prescription. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's the answer, the only answer. And Jesus said, as recorded in John 12, verse 32, But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. There's no substitute for meditating on the cross of Calvary. Seeing the Savior lifted up between heaven and earth on that rugged, splintery cross, there's no substitute for our reminding ourselves again and again that it was our sins, yours and mine, that put him there. There's no substitute for contemplating over and over again the closing scenes of the Savior's life for reflecting unhurriedly on the incredible love that led him to do what he did, for wondering if all eternity would be long enough to thank him. Nothing else can so transform you. Nothing else than the blood of Jesus can save you. Nothing but forgiveness can heal your guilt. What we need is not a technique, but a person. And Jesus is that person, and a transforming friendship such as you have never known can begin just now, if you desire, as we pray. Yes, Lord, let it begin now. Help us, as the familiar chorus says, to turn our eyes upon you, to look full in your wonderful face, till the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. Help us to look until we're captured by what we see, captured until we'll never be the same again, captured until our thoughts turn to you as naturally as the flower turns to the sun. And Lord, we won't have given up a thing except our guilt except a sin-stained heart for you to cleanse, except the emptiness of our lives. What an incredible transaction. Thank you, Lord, that this transforming friendship is available to every one of us. May not one viewer fail to accept it. I ask it in your saving, transforming name. Amen.
I would like you to meet my tiger friend. Her name is G.T. Here she is on the cover of the book that we're offering you today as our gift. It's my book, How to Live with a Tiger. And as you can see, we get along just fine. But getting along with a tiger isn't always so easy. A tiger in your gas tank is all right. Or a tiger in the zoo. Or a half hour before the cameras for making the cover of a book like this. But what do you do when you feel as if you have a tiger inside that you're fighting all of the time? When you keep doing the very things you vowed not to do, what then? Need this book? Well, we'll tell you in a moment where to phone or write for your personal copy. And remember, there's no cost or obligation at any time. I can speak from experience about the tiger inside. You see, this book is really the story of my own encounter, not only with the tiger, but with the claims of Jesus Christ. It's the story of my own conversion. It's the story of the crisis, the night I shook my fist at God and told him never to come back, as well as the happy sequel. Like to have the book, ask for it by name, How to Live with a Tiger, so that we'll know which one to send. That's all you need to do. But don't put it off. And here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. Could there be an easier address to remember? Just It Is Written, Box O, that's simply Box Zero, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week on this station. The address again is It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. I'll be waiting for your letter or your phone call requesting how to live with a tiger. And we'll have it on its way shortly. But now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 